After a decade's absence, race-based preferences are back on the Supreme Court's docket. Um, back in 2003, the Supreme Court decided that the University of Michigan Law School uh, could give very large preferences, as Dr. Nagai has described, uh, in order to admit um, a, quote, critical mass uh, of minority students. Many schools have interpreted that decision, Grutter versus Bollinger, uh, as an open-ended embrace of affirmative action of all kinds. Um, and many were emboldened uh, to ramp up their affirmative action programs. The University of Texas was one of those schools. Uh, for a short period of time prior to the Grutter decision, race-based preferences had been prohibited by the Fifth Circuit's decision um, in Hopwood versus the University of Texas. Um, and that was then overruled by the Grutter case. Um, as a result, at the time that the Grutter case came down, uh, Texas had in place an admissions policy designed to raise the number of underrepresented minority students attending its flagship Austin uh, campus by admitting the top 10% of the graduates of each Texas high school without regard to SAT scores. Um, with the 10% plan, Texas had said uh, that they didn't need preferences uh, because they were getting what they needed uh, even without discrimination at the individual level. Um, nevertheless, um, soon after the Grutter decision, the university announced that it was dis dissatisfied with the diversity that the student body had at Austin, 21% of which was composed of underrepresented minorities, 16.9% Hispanic and 4.5% African American. Um, and Texas decided the school would be implementing race preferences to boost that diversity. Under the new policy, the proportion of the student body composed of Hispanics and African Americans rose to 25%. The result was a lawsuit. The plaintiff is Abigail Fisher, a young cello player from suburban Houston. Um, she had academic credentials that were good but just a hair short of the cutoff for whites and Asians. Uh, and as a result, she was, she was rejected by Texas. Um, those credentials were, however, well beyond those necessary uh, for affirmative action beneficiaries. Her case, Fisher versus the University of Texas, uh, was argued before the Supreme Court uh, back in the fall. Uh, and it will be decided sometime between now and late June. Now, the court may decide the Fisher case based on very narrow grounds. Um, there are several dimensions uh, along which the Texas affirmative action policies are more aggressive than the Grutter policies were. Uh, for example, Grutter permitted universities to use racially preferential admissions policies to admit a critical mass of minorities to their overall student body. Um, Texas, however, takes the position that it needs critical mass, not just in its student body, um, but in each classroom, each program, and each major. Now, classroom critical mass uh, requires much more in the way of extensive preferences. It could even conceivably justify racial discrimination in course registration and other more aggressive discriminatory policies. The Supreme Court could easily decide the Fisher case on that basis. Affirmative action supporters worry, however, um, that the court will take this opportunity to cut back severely on the Grutter case. They point to changes in the court's personnel, most notably Sandra Day O'Connor's replacement with Justice Samuel Alito as a cause for concern. Since Grutter was decided 5-4, um, it may not take that much to swing the court into the opposite direction. The biggest change, however, has nothing to do with court membership. It is the mounting empirical evidence that race preferences are doing more harm than good, even for their supposed beneficiaries. If this evidence is correct, we now have fewer African-American physicians, fewer African-American scientists and engineers than what we would have had using race-neutral admissions policies. We also have fewer African-American college professors and fewer lawyers. You may not think that's a bad thing to have fewer lawyers, but um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> preferential treatment is making it more difficult for talented minority students to enter high-prestige careers, not easier. 
Um, one consequence of widespread affirmative action is that minority students tend to enroll in schools where their entering credentials put them towards the bottom of the class. While academically gifted, underrepresented minority students are hardly a rarity, there are not enough to satisfy the dem demand at the very top schools. When the most prestigious schools relax their admissions policies in order to admit more minorities, they start a chain reaction right down the line, resulting in substantial credentials gaps at almost all selective schools. This has the predictable effect of lowering the grades, the college grades, that the average minority student earns. And the reason for that is quite simple. While some students will outperform their entering credentials, just as some students will underperform theirs, most students perform in the range that their entering credentials suggest. No serious supporter of race preferential admissions policies denies this. Two generations of minority students have been systematically concentrated towards the bottom of their college classes. That means two generations uh, of minority students with disappointing grades. Students who are used to being less successful students than the overwhelming majority of their white or Asian counterparts. No one should cheerfully assume that all this will have no consequences. The strongest evidence of the effects comes from science and engineering. Contrary to what, what, what many people expect, college-bound African-American and Hispanic students are just as interested as white students um, in majoring in science and engineering. In fact, empirical studies show they tend to be a little bit more so, less than Asians, but more than whites. Uh, because these are difficult majors, and African-American and Hispanic students um, have lower entering credentials, uh, they jump ship at much higher rates than whites. Now, it's not surprising that those students who give up on their admission to get into science, to get a science or engineering degree disproportionately have academic credentials towards the bottom of their, of their college class. But what some people do find surprising is this. Three in-depth studies uh, have demonstrated that part of the effect is relative. And did I say three? It's actually four now. A fourth study came out uh, just a week or so ago, which I haven't had a chance to read. But three of them I can tell you about. Um, an aspiring science or engineering major who attends a school where her entering academic credentials put her in the middle or the top of her class is more likely to persevere and ultimately succeed than an otherwise identical student attending a more elite school where the same credentials put her in the bottom of the class. Put differently, she increases her chance of success, not just if her entering credentials are high, but also if those credentials compare favorably with her classmates. The earliest of these studies, entitled The Role of Ethnicity in Choosing and Leaving Science in Highly Selective Institutions, was published back in 1996 by a team led by Dartmouth psychologist Rogers Elliott. It found that a student who attended a school in which his math SAT score uh, was in the top third of the class was much more likely to follow through with an ambition to earn a science and engineering degree than was a student with the same score who attended a school in which that same score uh, was in the bottom third. Unfortunately, as a result of affirmative action, minority students in the top third were relatively rare. Two more recent studies uh, by the University of Virginia psychologists Frederick Smith and John McArdle, who's now at the University of Southern California, um, and by UCLA law professor Richard Sandard um, and UCLA statistician Ro Roger Bolas, each using different methodology and databases, have confirmed Elliott's uh, findings. The evidence that mismatch has hurt African American and Hispanic students chances of a career in science or engineering has gone completely unrebutted um, and was highlighted uh, in a report uh, that I had something to do with uh, of the US Commission on Civil Rights um, in 2010. The mismatch effect is not limited to science and engineering. In 2003, um, too late to be cited by the court in Gruder and Graz, uh, Dr. Stephen Cole and the late Eleanor Barber published Increasing Faculty Diversity, the Occupational Choices of High-Achieving Minority Students, 
Um, it found that mismatch was the prime reason that African American students are less likely than their academic peers uh, to pursue academic careers. And UCLA law professor Richard Sander has shown the same result um, with law schools um, and has published a, a book recently on that. Um, divorced from the affirmative action context, this conclusion would seem utterly ordinary and unobjectionable. Um, it is only when it becomes associated with politically charged issues uh, dealing with race that it becomes controversial. Back in 1966, University of Chicago sociologist James Davis published research demonstrating that a student who attends a school that is out of his academic league is often professionally disadvantaged by that experience. As Davis concluded in his article, which was called The Campus as a Frog Pond, an application of the theory of relative deprivation to career decisions of college men. What he said uh, was, and I'm quoting him here, Counselors and parents might well consider the drawbacks as well as the advantages of sending a boy to a, quote, fine college if, when doing so, it is fairly certain he will end up in the bottom ranks of his graduating class. That research spawned an entire cottage industry of sociological research in that area. Um, starting back in 1966, but no one dared bring it up um, in connection with affirmative action. So why has mismatch received so little attention in more recent years? Part of the answer um, may be the seemingly contrary findings of Bowen and Bach's book, The Shape of the River. In that book, the authors, both former Ivy League college presidents, uh, university presidents, uh, purported to prove that racial preferences increase the earnings of affirmative action beneficiaries, even when their academic credentials are very much below the school's average. The book received an astonishing um, amount of publicity. A fawning editorial in the New York Times announced, for example, that the book, quote, flatly refutes the arguments of critics of affirmative action. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette editorialized that the notion that race-based admissions uh, have hurt African-American students is, quote, one that can be dismissed. But for reasons detailed in my article, The Sad Irony uh, of Affirmative Action, which, by the way, you can find on that table over there, um, and is absolutely free, um, for reasons that you will see in that article, um, it all was a mistake. Um, in the book, The Shape of the River. The authors purport to show that attending a school like Princeton rather than a school like Penn State um, on average contributes to the income of black students. They appear oblivious, however, to the bombshell contained in their own figures in the book's appendices. College grades generally contribute more again and again through the dif different permutations of their own analysis, their own figures show it. Imagine two black males with identical SAT scores. Both were in the top 10% of their high school class. Both come from middle class families. Only their colleges are different. The authors convincingly, convincingly demonstrate that if the two have the same college major and the same grades, the, the one who attended Princeton will earn considerably more than the one who attended Penn State. But what if they don't have similar grades? By the author's own calculations, it is better to be a black male at Penn State in the top third of the class than Princeton in the bottom third of the class. High grades are worth almost twice the increased earnings one gets from attending Princeton. If one's class rank and major were unrelated to the selectivity of one's college, then it would be perfectly sensible for the authors to celebrate the finding that all things being equal, all other things being equal, black males get an earnings boost uh, when they attend Princeton. But those things are not unrelated. The only question is whether a student who attends, a Princeton, attends Princeton and winds up um, in the bottom third of the class would likely have been in the top third at Penn State? And the answer to that question is yes, he stands a darn good chance of it. Consider, for example, a black male 
with an SAT score, uh, math and verbal, of 1,300, who just missed being in the top 10% of his high school class. Um, if he attends Penn State, his SAT scores would put him exactly in the 75th percentile. That would give him an excellent shot at earning grades in the top third, and maybe better. If he enrolls in Princeton instead, his SAT scores would put him 90 points below the 25th percentile, thus making it very unlikely um, that he could earn high grades or even grades towards the middle of the class. Now, should the Supreme Court of the United States consider data like this in making their decision? The answer to that question, I believe, is that they already have. They considered data like this in departing from usual Supreme Court precedent in finding that discrimination on the basis of race is to be shunned. Um, should they consider data like this in a vacuum? Certainly not. Uh, but the Grutter case was a, was a serious error, I think, and a serious departure um, from the Supreme Court's treatment of racial discrimination in the past. Uh, they relied on, on the belief that this was doing a wonderful thing. Um, and now it's turned out that that was gravely mistaken. Um, I think I should stop there and... Thank you, Gail.